Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gents. You can tell I'm a little bit smaller than Stefan, who's a, a big guy. Uh, for those that I can't see hiding over there behind the model, I'm Tom Williams. I'm executive vice president for programs and also look after customer services. And I think probably a lot of you have heard me um, rattle on at these events in the past. So I'll try and give you a quick run through, maybe not spending too much time on the slides, but maybe then just going to the, the Q&A, which is probably a bit more interesting. Uh, in terms of where we are, clearly the, the, the key message is on single aisle, because it's, it's still very much the, the engine room of our business today, the cash cow uh, that, that we operate, along with the current long range family. Uh, we've, we've passed the 6,000 mark now, you can see that there's a, a very strong uh, demand continuing, production rates continue at levels that, to be quite honest, if you had asked me uh, 10 years ago, I took over the program management job and in all that time we were talking 10 years ago about how could we build 27 or 28 AC20s a month and, and there were actually people on my staff at the time when we talked about going to rate 30, they said, don't be stupid, that's one aircraft a day. It's, it's, it's beyond the laws of physics to build that number of aircraft every day. It's never been done. So, so here we are talking about 42 and even going beyond up to, to rate 46. The good news is, as we've continued to increase production levels, at the same time we've been continuing to improve the product and operational reliability and the quality of the aircraft, I think, is better now than it's ever been. And that's uh, well respected by, by the customers if you look at the 99.7% operational reliability. In terms of where we are with, uh, with production rates, I think Klaus gave you a fairly extensive presentation on NEO this morning, so I won't, I won't repeat that. Uh, 42 aircraft a month, highest ever civil aircraft production rate, and of course an expectation that we'll take that beyond up to, to rate 46. And I'm sure John would say even rate 46 is not enough for him, particularly as we look out towards the end of the decade and where we are on, on new uh, availability. The other important thing, I think Klaus talked about what we're trying to do to optimise seat count both on the AC20 and on the 321. And I think with those programmes you can see tremendous interest in 321 in particular. Uh, and, and Effectively, what we've said is we need to take the 321 up to 50% at least of our available manufacturing capacity because we see that level of demand for 321 in the future. Where is that coming from? Of course, a large part of it's coming from 757 replacement market. And you'll see a situation today if you look at the deliveries we've done to people like American Airlines with a, a very comprehensive three-class layer. We make good use of the extra uh, diameter of our tube on the 320 family to give more seat comfort, more, more space to the passenger. Uh, and of course at the same time we've got the ability to put in some pretty complex systems. So you'll see 321s delivered today that offer the same com comfort level and standard the, uh, on, a, on a, a local flight as you would find on an international flight. And of course increasing demand to go to things like lie flat bed, uh, full entertainment systems, uh, and, and so a much richer specification, particularly driven around the A321 family. And I think the flexibility of the layout gives the, the airlines a lot of choice in terms of how they get the best revenue potential out of that floor space. Uh, in terms of, of enhancement, clearly obviously safety enhancement as we grow quickly, we've got to make sure that we work on things like uh, training, and, and Didi, I think we'll talk to you a little bit more about that tomorrow, Didi looks. Uh, but clearly we're also continuing to work on things like fuel burn efficiency. And, and the shark that you'll now see is, is pretty much, uh, most of the aircraft around the delivery centres you'll see are shark equipped. Uh, all of the aircraft come with wings that are shark capable. It doesn't mean to say every, every customer has to take a shark uh, But they all then see up to 4% fuel burn savings. In fact, on longer missions, if you're flying around three hours, 4.1, 4.2% is, is quite achievable. Uh, and that's been very well received by, by all of our customers. As a result of that, we had a demand to, to offer a Sharklet retrofit program. 
and we do that in two parts. We, you can either have an aircraft that's shartlet ready, it's got a reinforced wing, in which case you get a, you get a pair of shartlets, you get some new software, you take the aircraft into the hangar overnight, you take off today's wingtip fences, you plug in the new shartlet, you reload the software in the flight management system, and the next morning you take the aircraft out of the hangar and it's ready to go. For those aircraft that have been built prior to the reinforced wing, there's a more extensive exercise. You have to replace about two meters of the outer wing tip fence, uh, and as a result of that, also put in some reinforcement. But now we have some very strong commitment from quite a number of customers who are starting to be actively interested in what could they do to, to update their older aircraft. And obviously that's a good business opportunity for us in the customer services side. In terms of noise, you can see that we've, got, we've had a family of improvements. Uh, clearly the new engine option Klaus talked to you about is a big part of that. The shartlets help you in terms of not only reducing overall aerodynamic noise, but they also improve your lift ratios. So that allows you, if you're flying in an airport perimeter, to, to climb much more quickly, reduce your noise footprint, and try and keep it inside the boundaries of the airfield. The airflow, these are the famous NACA ducts that you saw we developed in conjunction with Lufthansa, particularly because they were wor worried about some very sensitive airports like Frankfurt, which reduce a little bit the noise coming from these rather small areas, but important in terms of contribution. Uh, and of course, then the other thing, we're looking at different approaches. Uh, RPA, or, or required navigation performance, allows us to fly more optimized paths and, and reduce the noise signature to particularly dense airports where there are significant challenges in terms of big populations. I don't go through all of these because I think you probably, some of you are familiar with them, but obviously Sharklet, Spaceflex, I think yeah, it was talked about this morning, the IFE systems, landing gear improvements. So there's, the, the point to make, I think, with this slide is that there's a continuous innovation. And if you were to look at the aircraft that was delivered 20 years ago, you might say, well, it looks like a 320, therefore it must be a 320. But the reality is we're constantly evolving. Some of that evolution comes from the push from suppliers, particularly in other electronic systems, where they say, we've got obsolescence, these chips are no longer available, printed circuit board moves from pinhole technology to surface mount, etc., etc. It's also the opportunity for us in terms of driving improvements to the product, in terms of reducing the number of modules, because there's much more computing power, so you can replace uh, three black boxes with one in that situation. You bring improved operational reliability. You bring reduced power consumption, which is important. When you have, to have more and more requirements for things like IFE, which are power-hungry kind of devices. Uh, you, you reduce, uh, in, in that situation, part count, and you improve maintenance and reliability. And of course, at the same time, we also use that as opportunities to drive cost reduction. And, and I, I reflect on the previous question that was asked of Simon. Obviously for us, we, we don't, you know, we have programs like Power8, you probably heard us talk about Scope, Scope Plus, uh, and we're constantly looking, it's a, it's a battle that never ends, you know, I've been in Airbus since 2000, and, and we've been always on this evolution of looking at how can we optimise cost. We try to do that in, a, going back to his, his comment about the partnering for success, we try to avoid getting into the, the next size of baseball bat. You know, let's not just go beat the suppliers up with a, a bigger baseball bat than the one we did two or three years ago. And we try and find win-win situations in that situation. Single source, dual source, innovation in the product. Uh, it, it has to be about trying to create some value on both sides, not just trying to, to, to slice some margin of what your suppliers are doing. Uh, so I think we've got a, a fairly innovative approach we have, to, to a certain extent, reduced the, the kind of window. If you look at our tactics, and Klaus probably talked about it this morning, as you look at what we're doing on NEO, we've had a kind of a, a period of, of uh, reducing the amount of change because we want the evolution of the NEO to have as, met, as few risk elements in it as possible. So we've, we've taken an approach to the NEO development as fairly conservative. But that doesn't mean to say there isn't then a pipeline of ideas coming beyond that. That won't you know, transform the product in some way. It'll be the same evolution that we've had before. 
but it will be continuous improvement in the way that we, we develop the product for the next, until the end of 2028-2030, uh, when I think at that point clearly the NEO will still be the, the key part of our product portfolio. Uh, the file US progressing extremely well. This shows your picture of 350 recently when they were overdoing their weather trials. They, they, they dropped in to, to uh, make a little visit to our folks in the US. And that facility coming on extremely well. And I think the good news as well is the enthusiasm of, of the people. We've found that our recruitment process in the US going extremely well. We're really pleased with the quality and the enthusiasm of the people that are coming on board. And I think our facility in Mobile will be really a, 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 a real crown jewel for us in terms of our ability to be seen to be a strong local citizen uh, and to also help us to make further penetration into the US market. <clears throat> 330 is the other uh, key important ingredient for what we do today. We're producing at rate 10, which is a rate that's never been matched by any other white body program worldwide. So it's, a, it's going at a fair pace. Patrick Peter Fita and his team live with the challenges and problems. And of course, rate 10, when you're, when you're dealing with an aircraft like 330, which tends to be pretty highly customized, brings its own challenges in terms of managing the, the, the BFE, the SFE suppliers mainly around things like the more complex seats, entertainment systems, etc. So it's a, although it's a mature program, it presents its challenges to the teams every day. Again, a constant evolution. We don't stand still with the 330 program. Uh, you'll be aware that we've got the 242 tonne model that we will go into service in, in uh, 2015 with Delta Airlines. That comes from a combination of aerodynamic improvements, from engine improvements, and also, of course, making use of the, the optional centre tank, which we've not done for, for 330-300. So, at the same time, we're, we're, as we're stretching range and performance, we're also looking at the local markets, and I'm sure John would have talked this morning about a 330 regional. And, of course, where we talk about 330 as being the long-range aircraft, there are many markets in the world, particularly places like Asia, where if you get on a flight from, uh, from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, you'll quite often find you're flying on a 330. Uh, and that's because just the density of those routes, the fact that it's only a 45 minute or a one hour flight, uh, the, the airline would still say it's an intelligent use of capacity. So when we look at the, the, the dense routes, uh, and those routes that have got high growth and where things like air traffic management, uh, airport infrastructure struggle to keep up, we think that the 330 regional will offer some very good opportunities, particularly in marketplaces like China. Again, significant investment in 330. I won't go through each one of them. I think most of you are probably familiar with the technologies, but I think this chart is really just to prove that it's not that we stand still, we keep a constant evolution on the 330 family. Uh, some of them are small things, apparently, but when you look at the cumulative effect, it means that we keep the product uh, very attractive. And the reality is today the 330 has outstanding operational economics and very, very high reliability. And for all those airlines that you talk to that operate 330 today, they'll tell you it really is the workhorse of the fleet. Uh, it does most of the, the heavy carrying for a lot of the major airlines around the world. The 330 242 tonne development's going well. We've actually already flight tested a lot of the external features, the aerodynamic improvements we've made in terms of flap reduction, flap track fairing <laughs> redesign to, to improve and optimize the aerodynamic flows. All of those things are actually being tested on aircraft that are flying today. And you can see some of the major components are actually coming together even now. So I think that process is progressing very well. And at the same time, of course, we're, we're very conscious that we want to make sure that the other parts of the 330 experience for the passenger are, are, are reflecting state of the art that we've developed on 350. So you'll see that in terms of fourth generation IFE, cabin systems, you see here the flight attendant panels, uh, full light LED lighting with controllable mood lighting, and of course looking at more efficient galley inserts, uh, which, which gives better spares, more, more interchangeability between the 330 and the 350 fleet. <clears throat> 
380, 132 deliveries. You see Asiana, which we delivered just a couple of weeks ago, and, and they were delighted, I think, to, to get our aircraft into service. And again, constant innovation as far as the 380 is concerned. Incremental, but still constant. New design weights, and you see there we've gone up to 575 tons. So with this, we can either bring eight tons of additional payload or 500 miles of range, although the 380, of course, already has phenomenal range capability. Constant improvements with our engine uh, suppliers in terms of improving SFCs. We work on weight reduction, and we also work on areas like aerodynamics, particularly on things like wing twist, where we can optimize airflow and, and improve the overall aerodynamics. It's a big wing. Seat count, I think the next area where there's some opportunity, you've probably had a lot of discussion and we, we stick very strongly with our policy that an 18 inch seat width is, is very important. We don't want to be cramming people into less than that. But we think there is a, a solution on the 380 to go to a living abreast seating and, and the difference here is just in the sidewall. And, and if you look at this little diagram, we can make a basically a carving out of, of some space that we didn't perhaps optimize as much as we could have when we put in the sidewall linings uh, and still with a very comfortable 18 inch seat and keeping today's aisle width which is very important in terms of trolley service and people getting past to go to the toilets etc then, then we keep the same efficiency and, and movement inside the aircraft so i think you can see that from a 380 point of view we, we constantly keep moving and, and there's no standing still that's it as far as I'm concerned in terms of just the, the serial programs. Stefan, I'm happy to take uh, questions now. Thank you, John. <coughs> now we're ready to take questions. And the first question goes to Andrea Rossmith. Hi, hello. Hi. Um, you said that you've been spending about 150 million euros or was it euros or dollars? Euros on the A330 a year. If you were to do a NEO, how much would that cost and approximately what percentage of that would you have to shoulder as compared to engine makers? Uh, I think a large piece of that, clearly if you were to take the model of the 320, if we were to launch an A330 NEO, then clearly a lot of that comes in, in the engine development. From our point of view, it's a relatively straightforward exercise. And we do some reinforcement of the wing, we have a new nacelle, which is, is a significant piece, and of course a new pilot. So those are the key areas of change. I won't give you the numbers. Though. The next question goes to Patrick Rahir, AFP. <clears throat> Hi Tom. Can you take us through the problems with the doors of the, the A380? Uh, when the risks were found uh, on the wings, uh, you said you'd have to deal with this for uh, at least two years. Uh, how serious is this problem? How much is it going to cost? Do you have to replace the doors or can you just fix them? No, I think the situation on the doors, probably most of you are aware, we had a particular incident which was Baku, uh, where we had the diversion of the Singapore aircraft. Uh, but we would had also, prior to that, complaints from customers about noise on 380 doors. And that was mainly coming from seal issues. Uh, and so we also, at the same time, we're doing work on a fatigue model, and the fatigue model that we're running up in Dresden has actually come to the end of the, of the, the fatigue test exercise, which is about three times the design service goal. I remind you, design service goal 19,000 cycles on the, uh, on the 380. So we came with some experience from that. We found some issues of uh, fatigue earlier than we had anticipated, still inside the goals, but still not what we wanted to see. And we were concerned about particularly the cover plate, and that's the, there's a strip of metal that goes across the top of the door, and I guess that's probably what you, you were aware of from Baku, where we saw that that, that piece of metal went into a, a resonance, which is a, a, high, a high frequency uh, aerodynamic induced resonance, and that resulted in tearing back a piece of the seal, a piece of the door cover plate. Uh, as a result of that, we've looked again at, at all of the, the door design, and, and there are, in combination with what we land out of the fatigue sample, we've recognized that there are some areas which, although they're not a safety issue, they will be an issue longer term. So the aircraft are fine to fly today, there's, there's no particular issue. But we did issue, as you're probably aware, back in January, an inspection <coughs> guideline 
and, and told the airlines that if they had a particular noise problem, that there was an ultrasonic test that they had to do just to check if there were any issues of, of cracks or any other fatigue issues to be, to be found. We did find a relatively small number of doors where we had that issue. Uh, those doors are, again, safe to fly on for a certain period of time. And, and at the moment, what we're doing is developing a program of repairs. We won't be replacing doors. We'll be taking the doors that are in situ, and we'll be applying some local reinforcements to overcome issues such as the door cover plate. So that's a program that will agree with airlines, and we'll do that on a progressive basis, probably linked in with things like the 2C and 3C checks. Next question, over there. Here. So, how many doors today? We'll check all the doors. We'll check all the doors in that process. How many have you found have this problem? It's less than 10% of the doors that have been checked have had a problem. So it's a relatively small number. Next question over there. Here. Here. Next question over there. Agustin Marletti, newspaper and cronista commercial from Argentina. What is the future of the A380 freighter? I remember eight or ten years ago, they had orders from FedEx, UPS. Yeah, I think the 380 freighter today is not part of our product plans, and, and I don't really see that happening anytime soon. Uh, whether in the longer term, as, as aircraft become older, would it be converted? into a freighter, that's, that's an option. But at the moment, uh, there is no, there's no active plan to have a 380 freighter program. Next question goes to Reuters. Hello, uh, Cyril Meyer from Reuters. Uh, can, can you work us through uh, the, the integration and, uh, of IFE and the connectivity you're doing in uh, the A220? Is it uh, uh, only on new aircraft produced or also in retrofit? <coughs> And uh, is, is it also the case for other programs? And is it a basic configuration for the A350 to have the, the connectivity to Wi-Fi? Okay. Um, I would probably have to take the rest of the afternoon to give you a proper presentation on IFV. Uh, and also in connectivity. And, and, and clearly connectivity is... I'm probably the last person to be responsible for something like connectivity because I'm probably the wrong generation. So when my guys come to me all excited and say, oh, we've got a great new connectivity idea, everyone will be able to get a hold of you constantly. You can imagine, I think, oh, God, because the one time I get any peace is when I get on an airplane and the door shuts and for the next seven or 13 hours I don't need to talk to anyone or listen to any problems. Uh, so so I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm probably a bit old-fashioned and have to be a bit more proactive in the process. We've got a lot of interesting ideas. I mean, I think the, the question of IFE and, and connectivity, probably on the single aisle family, the critical issue is the one of cost and complexity. And the, the, the key issue today is there are a lot of entertainment systems available, but those IFE systems today, if you talk to a lot of the airlines, they'll tell you that IFE is their number two maintenance cost issue, engines being number one. And so there's a sense of how do we get IFE systems that are what the customer's looking for, but at the same time don't have the issues that exist today. And a lot of those issues are related to things like the technology is changing faster than the manufacturers can keep up, so there are maturity issues. There are a lot of issues about the size of the units, their weight, power consumption, and the amount of heat they throw out. All of that makes it, it's okay to do that on a big aircraft like long range, on single aisle, I think what you'll see today is a lot of innovation around lightweight IFE and, of course, the use of tablets. So I, I think you'll see the market begin to separate. And there will be those, the low-cost carriers, who will say, I'm not going to put any of that on my aircraft because it all adds complexity. There will be those, like American Airlines, who want to give a three-class layout and they want to have exactly the same capability. And there will be those that will start looking at a mid-solution where they let people bring their tablets on board, but maybe also let them update with things like live news. So we can see with SATCOM connection how to do that. I think the issues then are SATCOMs are big, they take a lot of weight, they add drag to the aircraft, 
So again, question marks about how you make sense of that. And lastly, of course, connectivity. My personal view is that that probably is okay if it's things like text and data. I think in terms of live calls, the experience on that hasn't been great. I think most people feel a bit inhibited about making live calls, thank God, when they're on an airplane. Next question is for Tom, good day, Dave Pippen from Australian Business Travel. You spoke about optimising the space usage of sidewalls to take the A382 11 abreast at 18 inches. Um, is this related to um, the notion of raising the floor by two inches, which was mentioned by uh, the CEO of Leasing Company under data? And if so, when would you expect that version of the A380 to be available to operators? No, we decided that since I've got wee short legs, the raising the seats didn't work. You know? I end up with my legs kind of dangling in space. All right, for a big guy like you. Uh, it was an option. I mean, clearly, if we raise the seats, we, we get more diameter and, and it had some attractions. But I think uh, the view of, our, of, of all our teams and feedback from customers was it probably wasn't great from a customer point of view. And, and you get into all sorts of issues about certification, 16G, testing, etc., etc. So the sense was better we keep the seat at the level we're at. And what we've done is, is to make this optimised seat, because on the side walls of the 380, you've got a pretty deep section. And we don't have to win too much. So the answer is no, we keep the seat heights as they are, and we win a little bit of space on the outside. And you, you'll notice on the diagram is a little bit narrower armrest on that outside part of the diagram. But when would you expect that to be available? By Sorry? It, it, it's available, I think the question is when would people want it, and, and at the moment there's no, we haven't got any commitment, but it's again part of the improving the offer. Three more questions next to Flight and FT and then Sebastian Stank. Marty Morrison from uh, Flight International, Flight Global. Uh, Tom, getting back to um, A330 Neo, if you, if you were to go with that, how likely is it that it would be with a, a single engine supplier? And can you say anything about where you are in talks with an engine manufacturer or engine manufacturers on that project? I think we talk to engine manufacturers all the time. I mean, I, I sometimes feel I see more engine manufacturers than I do my, my wife. That's pretty much true. So, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of take the view we're open to suggestions. If we were to do an A330, clearly today there's, there's a lot of interest of, of, in, of customers you know, if you look at today's A330, we've got three engine choices, and people like to have that choice. So yes, it would be nice, I think, to have uh, a choice, but I think there's a lot of decisions we have to be made before we get to the decisions about engine manufacturer selection. Next question to FT. Uh, Tom, with your um, head of program, um, head on, could you give us your take on whether there's a strong case for an A380 NEO? A new engine option. And then on the 330, I mean, look, the 330 program is a very mature, profitable program today, but with a relatively shallow order backlog. So, how important do you think is an A330 NEO to extending the life and profitability uh, of the aircraft, given you've got 350 loss making in early years, 380 only reaching break even right then? Yeah, I think your first question was on 380. My view would be clearly at the moment, I don't feel any rush for us to make any decision on 380. I think the backlog is still good enough and, and clearly we've got campaigns that we're still pursuing. So I'm not, I'm not overly concerned about that, I have to say. And, and certainly if we're going to do something in 380, you'd have to be convinced that it would be something significantly better. I think the aircraft's got great range and capability today. I think all the passengers are flying and love the experience. So I think it's got still a lot of, a lot of assets in the marketplace. Uh, on the 330, I think the question would be, uh, it's, it's been a great product. Uh, we would love it to continue to be a great product. We think it can be a good match with the, the 350 family. Uh, we've got to be convinced in our own minds again that we can bring a significantly better uh, performance from a customer point of view. And clearly, from my point of view, I think it would be on the basis that we would do something that would be for the long term. I certainly wouldn't be interested in doing a short term program for only four or five years. It's got to be an aircraft that would be powerful enough in the marketplace for, you know, till the end of the next decade kind of, of time scale. Uh, 
last question to Sebastian Steinke. Sebastian Steinke from Flug Revue to your very left in the back. Hello. Uh, oh. I have a question concerning the 380 as well, please. Uh, when is the right time to stretch it? You mentioned you are already thinking about increasing the capacity. Uh, the plans for the family are to stretch it one day. When will be the time to do it? Thank you. I think in terms of stretch, we I don't feel a particular rush. I mean, we do a lot of evaluations and studies as we study everything. Uh, I think there are quite a number of things that can be done, first of all, to optimize the layout. And I think we'd have to be honest and say that a lot of the early layouts that we did are very nice, very, very comfortable, perhaps a little bit too comfortable in some areas. And we perhaps got a little bit carried away in, in working with some of the airlines. Uh, and, and now you've, you've, you get a sense of a lot of people coming back and looking at a more optimised layout to try and get more seat count. So there's, there's an awful lot you can do with the real estate that exists today before you have to worry about stretching it. And I think the other question would be if you're going to do a stretch, certainly from my point of view, the question would be what's the business case? And there are some customers like Tim Clark that would tell you that if we did a stretch he would order you know, 50 aircraft tomorrow, I think was his comment at the Dubai show. Uh, but would there be others? You know, and I don't particularly want us to be in a situation where we're developing an aircraft with just one customer in mind. So I think step one is to optimize and make good use of the huge amount of real estate that's already there. And then maybe in some future years we can think about it, but I don't feel any rush to, to go to a stretch. Okay, thank you, Tom. Very much.